Welcome to the Mean Lady Talking Podcast. This is the podcast that tackles tough questions about relationships, life, love, and loss. It may not be the advice you want, but it's probably the advice you need. And now here's your host, grief therapist, motivational speaker, relationship expert, best-selling Good author, day, and attorney, everybody. This the is not Susan really Elliott, mean, host mean the lady, lady herself, podcast, Susan J. Elliott. And welcome to our 50th episode. Yes, I know I've done like 73 shows, but I've done some episodes with series. And I might actually break this one into a series. As you guys know, I sit here and I just a blather. So I may run out of time. I usually try to wrap it up when I see my little audacity thing go to like 35 minutes. And unless I've been sitting here staring at the ceiling, that's about when I try to wrap things up. So if I'm at 35 and I haven't really said everything I've wanted to say, I will make this a 50th episode extravaganza. Thank you so much for your emails. Thank you so much for your reviews. I love my reviews. I just got three wonderful reviews. Thank you so much. I'm going to be putting them on the gettingpassionbreakup.com website under the Mean Lady Talking Podcast reviews. And as you know, you might not know. I don't know what you know. I'm an attorney, so in court, we're not allowed to be saying, you know, what people know, because it calls for the operation of their mind, and oh, evidence, you can't do that, so anyway, let me tell you what's going on, MeanLadyTalking.com is coming soon, I will let everybody know when that happens, I just, today, it's March 25th, I just spent eight hours or so going through 500 emails that I've had since like March 10th. I think March 10th was the last time that I responded to emails. Some people that I know, some people that I don't know, but I was finishing up my boot camp starting and I'm starting the codependency boot camp the first week of April, I hope. And I finished up my other boot camp. I officially ended it today. And because the summer heat really bothers me, I'm not going to be doing a boot camp the end of July or August. So if you want to be part of the May boot camp, please send me email, Susan at gettingpastyourbreakup.com or PM me on Facebook. Or if you're in the Facebook group, I'll be announcing it there first. But the codependency boot camp sold out quickly, and I expect that this one will sell out quickly because I'm not doing any more until October. I do payment plans, and when people say to me, oh, that's too much money, it's not for what you get, and I never questioned. When I went to see John Bradshaw, I went to see Stephen Levine, I went here, I went there, I ran all over the place doing my recovery. I never said, oh my God, that's too much money. I said, okay, that's what they're charging. I want to see them. There I go. People have said that it would be a bargain at five times the price because I do pay a lot of attention to my boot campers. Anyway, that's what's going on in the great mean lady talking queendom. And I wanted to say I did get email from you guys about the Chris Watts confession. I'm going to do a show on it. And I'm telling you, that guy is sicker than I thought. And it really, it ticked me off for two things. First of all, he seems like he's enjoying himself up there in Wisconsin. You guys have got to not be so damn nice to him. And the man's a psychopath. He's an absolute psychopath. Anyone who could describe the way he killed his children and poor Bella, who we knew she went through hell, but it was worse than we thought. She knew he killed her mother. She knew he killed her sister and she knew he was going to kill her. I mean, her last words on the face of the earth was no daddy, no. And what this man said was, I hope that people don't judge me in one moment in my life. If you kill your precious four-year-old child after killing her pregnant mother, pregnant with your baby, your son that you said you wanted, her sister, who was adorable, and Cece Actel had ADHD. She was like, a bundle of energy and I raise an ADHD child and I know that they can be a lot of work but she was also adorable because my husband Michael was ADHD and I know that ADHD people have a terrific side to them I know Michael was just wonderful and Cece was adorable and you freaking killed him and you don't want people to judge you on that moment 
and when I, you couldn't see his face, but I guarantee you there was no signs of life in his eyes when he said that. He's a true psychopath. And I don't care if he says, oh, I talk to Shanann every night and I cry every night for those girls. Screw you, buddy. Who cares? Anyway, I did go through the Nicole Kessinger interviews. I do think that they're both narcissists. They think they both have issues. But one of the things that I wanted to say was I will do a Chris Watts confession podcast. It's just so disgusting. I It took me days and I listened to it like four times and it took me days to, to go, wait, did he really say that? Wait, did he really do that? Before his confession, there had been discussion on YouTube. There was a, a guy in Australia that has a podcast called The Armchair Detective and he had said he had a a show that was titled what the shadow saw and people were saying, Oh, he, they published it before he did. And he stole it from them. I don't care. He was the first place where I saw this and I didn't jump on the, yeah, those are the girls bandwagon. He said there, it looks like, it looks like a kid got into the truck and there was all kinds of speculation. And I didn't think about it because to me, it was too horrible to think that that lunatic put his dead wife's body in the truck with two live children that he was going to kill. It was actually something I didn't want to consider. I wanted to believe that he killed those girls in their sleep and they had no idea what was coming. The DA had said that Bella put up a struggle and I had imagined she woke up while he was killing her and that she really didn't know what was going on. But now it's clear that she knew exactly what was going on. And it took him a long time to get out to that site. And she knew he had killed her mother and he knew that. And then he killed his sister. He buried a mother, killed his sister, put his sister in the tank. And then he came back for her. And when I was listening to the confession, I have a Yankees blanket on my bed and when he was doing the confession, he was talking about how they were carrying their Yankees blanket. And I'm looking at my blanket and I'm, I'm imagining this and I'm thinking, oh my God, so horrible, such horrible. It became, it would be real without me having the blanket, but I was actually staring at my own blanket that he was talking about. And I was, everybody wanted to know what he really did, but much of it was much worse than we thought. Anyway, so then I was looking at this, I sat down, I was watching this Judge Judy show and Judge Judy has gotten so cranky over the past few years that I've stopped watching her. And I started watching her before I even went to law school because I went to law school in 2000 and she came on sometime in the 90s. And when I would, when I went to first year law school, all of the judge shows are basically first year law school subjects. It's property, it's contracts, it's torts. So when I was in law school in first year, people would make fun of me because I would say, oh, there was a case on Judge Judy that said this. There was this tort case, there was this contract case, there was this property case. And sometimes when I would be in a class, people would go, oh, uh, was this on Judge Judy? It's the Wapner. It's definitely very small here. <laughs> anyway, the last few years I haven't watched it as much as I used to, but there was this one case. I couldn't, couldn't even believe it because Judge Judy has gotten very cranky. And she just, because when you go on their show, if you owe the other person money, the show basically pays it. They pay for you to go out to LA. They pay for whoever wins. And Judge Judy has been scammed a time or two. There was one case that people went on the in, on YouTube and they were talking about it. And I saw the case. Uh, the, there were these teenagers. They were like early 20s, late teens, early 20s. And they made up this whole case about how he came in her apartment and they were partying and he threw a television at a cat and he killed a cat and he broke the television. And Judge Judy actually awarded the girl money. And it turns out like the whole story was made up. None of this stuff ever happened. And they got a trip out to L.A. and they got money from the show and you know, all this other stuff. So she knew that she'd been scammed at least once. But once in 20 something years isn't so bad. But it, I, I would imagine it ticked her off. If she's anything like the family court here in New York says she was like, everybody here told me practicing with her that that she had a really good sense of humor, but she was really tough, but she's gotten very cranky. I wouldn't even say it's tough anymore. It's just cranky. So this woman 
first of all, she's living at home, he's living at home. So these two yahoos decide that they're going to date. Okay, so listen to this. She starts dating him in September. In November, he needs to borrow money from her. Why? Because Yahoo is not working and he is a meth addict who, who is on the run from people that he has gambling deaths to. Can you imagine? First of all, if you're going to pick a loser, you don't have to pick a loser who's, un, who's an unemployed meth head with gambling people after him. Okay, you could swing a cat and find a loser that only has one or two of those things wrong. Living at home, no job, meth head, gambling people are after him to break his kneecap. So she pays him $1,000. He cops to $1,000. Judge Judy didn't care. She's like, you're not getting $1,000. She's trying to teach her. And I understand this. I mean, I understand this. I see judges actually do this in court where they'll say, why did you give this money to this person? How could you possibly have an expectation of payback when they didn't have a job and they're all messed up? And why are you dating somebody who lives at home, doesn't have a job, has a, a meth problem and a gambling problem? Why? I have a feeling you did not do your standards and compatibility inventory from getting back out there. Now, how many times do I have to tell you guys that getting back out there is not a dating book? You should be reading it and committing to those standards in your inventory long, long, long before you ever get to dating. So, Miss I Have No Standards goes out there and now she's $1,000 in the hole and Judge Judy doesn't want to hear it. He copped to, to the $1,000. Judge Judy was like, mm, no, nope, you're not getting it. So, they're both talking and she's walking off, which is hilarious, which is something she's been doing lately. And I don't remember her doing the early days, but now she's just like, I'm done here. Send you people home. You had a nice trip to L.A. That's lovely. Goodbye. So anyway, then I was watching another show and I can't remember what it was. It was definitely not Judge Judy because I don't think these people would have shown up on Judge Judy. But anyway, he is coming out of a hospital where his daughter, who he has custody of, had been hospitalized for pneumonia and the mother had taken her into the hospital. The mother's a wacko. So the mother had taken her into the hospital and because he's leaving with her and she's wearing the clothes that she came in with, which the mother had bought and paid for, the mother takes the kids' clothes off before they get out into the cold. It's like 20 degrees out. I would have called CPS right then and there. So she wants to sue him for calling Child Protective Services on. They didn't know each other well, and she gets pregnant. Why in 2019 are people getting pregnant with people they don't know? Okay? She's a nut, and he is now connected to this nut for the next 18 years. Why? Put a condom on it. Take birth control. Why are you having sex with crazy people? Okay, you could have sex with crazy people, but have protected sex with crazy people. Don't have unprotected sex with crazy people because then you have hitched yourself to a crazy person for 18 plus years. What are you crazy? I remember I said this to my husband, Michael, I was, are all your exes nuts? And he was like, yeah, pretty much. I was the first same person he ever dated. What, what did you throw the dice up in the air? I mean, what did you do? Part of it is that you don't have good self-esteem. I just finished doing the advanced affirmation booklet, which is coming out. The new workbook version three is out and the Affirmation section has been revamped because affirmations are so important to the breakup process and to becoming better and liking yourself enough to be picky about who the hell you go out with. Put on your standards and compatibility thing. Must not be not. What's wrong with that? I mean, it's like you have to affirm your right to be with people who are not insane. And I know I go through the whole thing about not using not, but... I go through the personal bill of rights affirmation, which is something that, that is particular to this program. And in those personal bill of rights affirmations, you say, I have the right to be with people who treat me and my children well, if you have children. If you're going to have children, say, I have the right to have children with people who are not certifiably insane. Find a way to say it positively. I have the right to have children with people who are mentally stable. How about that? How about that? How about we just go for that? Why are we picking meth heads with gambling problems, no jobs, who live at home? Gee, that's somebody's star you want to hit your wagon to. He's going places. He's going right into the gutter. What part of those people after me are you going, oh, well, let me help you with that. I'd be like, see ya. See ya is 
an appropriate thing to say to somebody who has gambling debts and people who want to break their kneecaps after them. Oh, but it probably won't hurt because I'll be on meth and I probably won't know. And mom and dad will take me to the hospital because I live with them. Loser, loser, loser. You can find a loser with just a meth problem. You can find a loser with just a gambling problem. You can find a loser with a legal gambling problem so that the lottery commission is not out to break his kneecaps. You could find a loser who's living at home with no job and doesn't have a meth problem and doesn't have a gambling problem. What, what, what part of, oh, hi. I'm living at home. I don't have a job. I have a meth problem and a gambling problem. Want to go out with me? Sure. What are you, insane? But seriously, raise those standards. Get the Getting Past Your Past workbook version three and do those damn affirmations and do the damn standards and compatibility inventory and raise yourself up. This is ridiculous. There was another guy and I remember what show he was on. He was on the People's Court. It just came to me as I was sitting here talking. It's a Wapner. It's definitely very small here. He's running for mayor of New York City. Okay. He, again, has sex with this woman first night if you're with somebody and they are willing to have, I don't care if you're male or female, and you, they're willing to have sex with you the first night, there's something wrong. But unprotected sex, if you have political ambitions, put a condom on it, okay? Put a condom on it. He's standing in court. He's She's suing him for $2,700 because she says that she gave him $2,700 and he said that all she did was put it toward their child's college fund, okay? Another woman, totally out of her mind, and he is running for mayor. Now, the judge said that he owed it to her. But I'm like, what kind of idiot are you? Exactly. I don't want somebody who can't keep it in his pants for one night running New York City. They're running right into the ground. If this is the way you run your personal life, I don't want you running my city. No. And I won't get into guys who have all these other personal problems because I don't think they should be running things either. So... Anyway, that's all floating off the top of my head stuff. Something else that I wanted to talk about was how you get, and I don't know if this is going to be like a good 50th episode or not. I'm just ranting over here because people are so stupid. I mean, I have been doing this program for a long time. When I went to law school in the year 2000, I thought I was done with all of this. I thought I was done. I remember I worked for emergency services for a long time. And we used to call it enabling services because you could call up and say, I broke a shoelace, I broke a nail, I don't know what to do. And we had clinicians who would say, oh, you poor dear, go to the emergency room and I'll meet you there. And they'd be up there for six hours evaluating somebody who had a broken shoelace or a broken nail or something stupid. There were people who were in the mental health system that there was seriously nothing wrong with other than they had nothing better to do. There was a couple there because we had a clubhouse. Of course, we had a clubhouse. So we had the agency and they went to day treatment and they went to see their counselor and they did this. They spent all day there. And then we had a clubhouse because why not? And in this clubhouse are these two people and they decide that they don't have schizophrenia. They don't have borderline personality. They don't have anything like that. They're just people that go there for, for therapy. And for some reason they decided that they're so screwed up they don't need to work. They're collecting SSDI. This, I have lupus and I have terrible issues with my back. I have chronic venous insufficiency, I've, and I wouldn't even think about applying for Social Security disability. I have friends who are Social Security judges that I went to law school with. I know the ins and outs. I know how you can actually get it approved, but I'm not going to go through that. So I was on site one day, and they came over, and the guy's name was David, and I said, hi, David, what's going on? And he said, he told me he was having trouble with the girlfriend, and then his story was his father was an alcoholic, so he's ACOA, and his father once hit him with a fireplace poker. Once. Once hit him with a fireplace poker. And I would be sitting there and I'd be thinking, you know what, dude? My mother broke a freaking broom over my back when I had the flu and I was 16, okay? And when she was done beating the crap out of me, so the entire one side of my body was black and blue and swollen, she went back for the mop. And you're complaining to me that your father hit you with a fireplace poker when you were 18. That, like, ruined his whole life. And I was like, dude, like, get it together. So at that point, you know what? I'm going to law school. I'm not dealing with this anymore. I'm just not dealing with it. I can't listen to this. So 
many times we called emergency services enabling services. I used to work Friday and Saturday Saturday night overnight and I worked with this guy John and I always drove my Harley in the summertime and we worked 12 hours and they would call up on a Friday or Saturday night and they would say who's on because they knew all of us. Neither John nor I was going to enable anybody. Say is this Susan? Yep this is Susan. Who else is there? John. Then I would say, which John? And I would say, which John? Because I think we had three or four of them. And it would hang up because John wasn't listening to their crap either. I loved the schizophrenics and I'm not being sarcastic about that. We had some schizophrenics and in both agencies that I worked for, we had schizophrenics that were directed by the team to call emergency services, let us know what was going on talk to us before they went to bed. These were people that were trying to live on their own. I love working with schizophrenics and every single one that I worked with, I felt sorry for. I I know the pain. I knew the suffering. It's an awful, awful, awful disease. And I always wanted to help them. And when I was leaving, I was going to miss. And going to the emergency room for people that was seriously in psychiatric urgency somebody who was going to kill themselves or when they would bring the teenager who was the identified patient and i would dig into what was really going on in the family that stuff i loved absolutely loved but the other stuff is just all banal bullshit and i was like you know i'm not doing this anymore i'm not doing i'm going to law school i'm gonna be like judge judy i'm gonna go to law school and the hell with all this shit. And then I couldn't put it down. Be- and it's not because of people that go their entire life into counseling services because they got hit once with a fireplace poker. And this guy was so big. Like he was like six foot three. And I said to him one day, I said, David, how big was your father? And he told me his father was five inches shorter than him. So why didn't you take the poker away? I'm like, why are we still talking about this damn poker? So you have to get off the dime. You have to care about your therapy. And I said on the other, one of the other podcasts, and I got email about this, about firing clients. And I haven't fired many clients over 25 years. I really haven't. I have worked with people who ran out of money. I've given every client I've ever had more than an hour, almost every single session. And I give a lot, a lot, a lot to my clients, to my boot campus, to my seminar, to my workshop. I haven't fired many clients, but I've said this over the years. If I care about your recovery more than you do, or you playing in the sand with your destructive sick ex, I'm not the person who's helping you. Somebody else needs to help you because it's not going to be me. But I've only done that three or four times in 25 years. So when I came back to New York, I got the job I wanted. I went to a top 10 law school and I came back to New York City. And when you go to a top 10 law school, you punch your own ticket and you go to work for the big law firms and you make the big buck. And that's where I was coming to. And I left California in 2000. I practiced in Texas because 9-11 happened the day before our on-campus interviewing. So my plan was to come back to New York. All my New York interviews were canceled. I couldn't get a job and you have to have a job in your second year of law school and going through and explaining, well, 9-11 happened the day that we were supposed to have on-campus interviews. People don't care six years later. So I had to scramble. So I came back to New York via Texas. I had to take the Texas bar and I had to take the New York bar, which I did. And I came back to New York and I punched my ticket. I went to work for a top 100 law firm, international law firm. And that's what you go to a top 10 law school to do. And as soon as I got back to New York, as soon as I got back, to New York. There were people who said, I had a friend in New York. They, they're going through a divorce. Can you help them? I went, you got to be kidding me. You have got to be kidding me. And I started my classes. And what I, what I had in that class was two ladies from Long Island. And I'll tell you, this started the whole ball rolling. And if the lady from Long Island, whose name I cannot remember, I wish I could. I, I've saved, I have papers from when I'm 14. I wish I could find the papers of the lady because she started this whole thing. I did the learning annex classes and she was going through a divorce and I had given the class my email and she kept writing to me and writing to me and I did this little newsletter and I sent it out and then I started the blog and you, you guys know the rest is history. And when I did the article when the person you love doesn't love you about it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, wants to be with me, wants to be with me, wants to be with me, you guys all know the GPYB sayings, I was back in it and the reason I was back in it 
it was because she was a really nice lady. She was in her late 30s, I think. She was scared to death. Her husband had really, really done a number on her. And I'm sitting there at night doing my little learning annex. I think I was teaching boundaries and affirmations and goals, the standard stuff. And she kept writing to me. I wish I could remember her name. If you're out there, please let me know who you are. You were like so instrumental in this whole thing. And I kept feeding her advice, but I was working all day as a lawyer and I I couldn't let it go. I couldn't let it go. And this this wasn't people who were malingering. When I left emergency services, I was burnt out. I mean, I didn't want to listen to David and his stupid story about the fireplace poker anymore. I mean, I had been in therapy. I had talked about the broom incident once or twice. I didn't make a career out of it. I didn't collect social security disability out of it. I used to ride up on my Harley. <laughs> and I'm like five foot one. So it's like this little tiny lady's getting off this the Harley. And they would look at me like with these big eyes. And I would say hello in his like deep voice because I didn't want them like running in and thinking I was going to enable them because I wasn't and my boss and I used to get into it all the time his name his last name was Reuben and he and I used to get into it John and he used to get into it we were way too tough for his liking but you know we were we were the weekend overnight people I mean you know he wasn't firing us he was just disagreeing with our methodologies which was like Call me when you have an actual problem. You're not going to the ER for a freaking broken shoelace. We used to call it crossing the Rubicon. We used to say, oh my goodness, I'm leaving I'm leaving him a note. It's going to be crossed. Because we didn't really see him because we worked eight, eight at night till eight in the morning over the weekend. And he worked Monday through Friday, nine to five. So we really didn't see him, but he would leave like nasty nasty grams in our little mailboxes that we had so so john and i would would look at some of these some of these messages from him we go oh we crossed the rubicon (laughs) so anyway i felt burnt out and i know that my last discussion my long in-depth discussion with mr rubin who has since passed away and i felt really horrible i just started practicing law when i heard that he passed away and i felt really really bad about it he was a really nice guy and he had a phd and he was a good clinician we just had different takes on it he covered his butt as a lawyer now I understand a lot of stuff that they were doing then but at the time people were playing with the system and I didn't like it so when I came into private practice and I did private practice back then I had my own practice on the side but it was mostly grief and families and I did a lot of foster families because I was in the foster care system and I know the dynamics and I was really really interested in it In fact, when I went to law school, I took children in the law and family in the law. And I thought I was going to become a family law attorney, but I didn't. When your husband gets sick and dies on you, everything changes. So your priorities change, which mine did. And I wasn't interested in the money anymore. And I wasn't interested in defending people like Enron and Exxon and the big bad actors that are the ones that can afford the big law firm prices and the big expensive lawyers. So I left, never left the law. I still do a lot of divorce coaching. I still do legal cases as I want to, as they, they come in. I have a few right now that I'm really interested in, but they have to interest me and I have to be passionate about it. And and I am passionate about the ones for the people that have come. To. Anyway, and I've, do, I've done divorce coaching with people in other countries. It's, there's a certain way that you have to talk to judges and you have to talk to parenting coordinators. You have to talk to other attorneys. You have to talk to your attorney. And I'm very good at helping people with that, especially in divorce, custody, and child arrangements, all those kinds of things. But I had decided that I was putting this all away and it just, it wouldn't let me go away. So over the years, I haven't fired many clients. I've only fired clients who would take up a lot of my time, email me, oh, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, I'm hurting. And I spent several hours an email with somebody and then the next thing I know they're with their ex and I'm like wait a minute we just spent all this time talking about them. what are you talking about it hasn't been that much but you have to want it and you have to believe in it and I can't care about your recovery more than you do and I am urging people please 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 when I came out of this divorce that led to all of this stuff that led to getting past your breakup I was a 
broken person. I had nothing. My therapist told me I had zero self-esteem. I was codependent to the hilt. I had no boundaries. I was gaslighted all over the place, not only from my, my husband, but from my family. I had been in abusive relationships my entire life, and I was completely out of gas. I had held on to a horrible marriage through three affairs and many punches in the face and I was done. And I was done because the abuse trickled down to my kids and the dog. And I think that if he had not gone after the kids and he had not gone after the dog, I really wasn't ready to leave. I really wasn't. But it became the thing to do. And then my plan was, okay, I'm going to leave and I'm going to scare him because The other times that I was going to leave scared him. And then I will tell him, well, I will come back if you promise that you will never again abuse the dog and the kids. Now, I knew absolutely from him having abuses remorse with me where he's crying and I was dreaming about you and you're the only one I'll ever love and ba, 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 la, 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 stupid, stupid, stupid. Anyway, my plan was I'm going to tell him I'm serious about this. And if you want to come back, you have to promise me that you're not going to touch the kids with the dog. You're not going to march those kids down the stairs at midnight when you come home and you think that there's a Fisher Price toy somewhere in the house that they need to pick up. That was just complete and utter nonsense. And I couldn't see my kids growing up with that. And he had hit my older one in the back with a curtain rod and left a mark. And I was like, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. Because the abuse is now coming down to the kids and the dog. And I've had it. And my plan went to hell because he didn't want to come back. When I was giving him the rules, he was basically laughing at me because he had no plans of coming back. And I'm freaking out. I mean, absolutely freaking out. Like, what do you mean? What do you mean? I'm holding on to him on the stairs. He's going out the back door. And we had three or four stairs that went down to the back door. You came in the side door. You go down to the basement. You could go up into the kitchen. So he was leaving. And he's going down to the side door and I'm hanging on to his arm and begging him, the cheater, the abuser, the gaslighter, somebody who came in with a suit jacket with the person who would be his second wife, her kids' school pictures in his suit jacket. He did that when we were still together and he told me he had gone to a union meeting that night and I was like, I knew she wasn't involved in the union except being a union member. What the hell? And I knew who the kids were. So I'm begging this banana head to come back to me. And he says no. And I want to go jump off a bridge. Because I didn't know that everything that happened wasn't my fault. I didn't know that he was responsible for his own behavior. I didn't know that no matter what he said to me about, oh, you do this, you do that. And him telling me, oh, hitting you is the only way that I can beat you, blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking... Okay, I had no idea that the pain that I went through trying to hold on to that disgusting, horrible marriage, to that horrible human being. And I know everyone loved him. Oh, when he passed away, there were lines around the block. Everybody thought he was the freaking second coming. I know. Angel on the street, devil in the house. I would go to parties with him, to his friends, all his friends. And he would do the, I'm the comedian in the middle of the room. He would entertain everybody. Everybody loved him and I'd be sitting there. And then we'd go home and he'd fight with me for three hours. And when I would try to say something, all of a sudden it was 11 o'clock and shut it, shut it, shut it, shut it, shut it. That's what he would say to me. He told me what I was thinking. He would get mad at me for what I was thinking, even though I wasn't thinking that. And then it would magically turn 11 o'clock and he would turn into a pumpkin and we would have to go to sleep. And I'm begging for that crap to come back to me. Nay, 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 Pick yourself up. If somebody doesn't want to be with you, if somebody says, I want a divorce, I want a separation, I want a breakup, I want this, I want that, okie dokie, bye, bye. See ya, banana head. And then you go and build your own life. You figure it out. You figure out if somebody doesn't want to be with you, that's not the person for you. The person for you is somebody who thinks you're the best thing since the folded napkin. Nothing less will do. 
nothing, 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 nothing. Mm -mm. Now, I understand trauma bonds. I understand anxious attachment. I understand ambivalent attachment. I understand how the attachment styles work. I understand all that. I know John Bowlby's work and Mary Ainsworth's work like the back of my hand. I understand it all. It's not easy to get out. I crawled out. I have, I have a history that most people don't have. My freaking mother left me in foster care for eight years. And the deal with the Catholic Charities was you have to visit her at least once a year, otherwise she gets put up for adoption. And my mother would slide in under a year. And she'd be pregnant. And there'd be a brother and another brother. And the last time I saw her, she was pregnant. She was seven months pregnant with my youngest brother. And she never told me that I had an older brother who had been put up for adoption. And when I was a kid, I'd be going there and I'd be wondering, like, why the hell do you have these other children? And I have to say that my adopted parents were fine to me up until I was adopted. And then all hell broke loose. And I'll go into that another time because I have some theories about that. But I was eight when I was adopted officially. The last time I saw my mother, I, I was seven. And then she had a year to see me. And I guess she got busy with three boys. Why deal with me when she's has, she had four boys up until that point. And apparently I had a sister at some point. And she passed away at sit, from SIS. And my mother told me years later that she was convinced that God was punishing her because she gave me up. So that's why she couldn't have a daughter. And I was thinking, you could have had a daughter. You just didn't want me. You wanted my father, who was married to somebody else and living in Brooklyn. And I've gone on Ancestry and I've done the DNA. And I actually have paternal relatives. And nobody has, I've written to everyone who's been a DNA match on my father's side. I know nobody on my father's side. And I wish, wish, wish somebody would get in touch with me. But anyway, I had all kinds of crap. My adoptive family was abusive and alcoholic. And sometimes I feel like I'm still working through it. My husband, Michael, was so much like my father, but every in every good way. And he didn't have the drinking problem that my father had. He reminded me of my father a lot. And... It took me years to kind of work out my relationship with my father, with how I felt about my father. And I've done that. I've done all that work. I mean, I've had a lot of work to do. I had to be told at 30 years old, nobody has the right to put their hands on you. I didn't know that. I kept being told it was my fault. That breakup was the absolute best thing that ever happened to me. Absolute. And every single part of getting past your breakup are things that I have done. And I put this together. And I shared it with other people and then it worked for them and it worked for them and it worked for them. I didn't think that it was going to work for other people. I thought that I was loopy and loony and unique and I wasn't quite sure what was going on. But I crawled out of that wreckage and you can crawl out of your wreckage no matter what it is. And if you are having trouble with this breakup because you have abandonment issues, you have attachment issues, you have whatever issues, it makes it harder. But you know where to go. You know what to do. Everything that you need to do is in the in the books and the workbook and more stuff is coming. I'm writing another book. I'm writing the book When the Person You Love Doesn't Love You, all about attachment. I'm going to be putting an attachment group together and I hope that people who have attachment issues will join that group. I'm still working on the format. I have a GPYB boot camp starting in May. The codependency boot camp is sold out. It's sold out very quickly. It is going to start the last few days of March, the first few days of April. Different people are taking different vacations. I'm trying to get everybody together. So the GPYB one will start in May and then I'm going to hopefully have material together for an attachment abandonment group. I would really like to do that. Anyway, I'm going to do part two because it is now over 40 minutes and I'm probably going to cut up a bunch of this, but I do want to get it out to you guys. And I want to let you know that Yeah, this breakup is a devastating loss, but it can absolutely be the best thing that ever happened to you. It's going to force you to look at your issues. It's going to force you to look at how did I get into this relationship? Why don't I have standards? Why am I attracted to banana heads? What is going on? It's going to be okay. It's going to absolutely be okay. And you can do this. And I want you to do this. I want you to believe in this. This program works. It's a program. Get the the workbook do the work 
You can do it. You absolutely can do it. And it can turn into the best thing that ever happened to you. Cause, and I didn't do a podcast last weekend. So I really want to get this part out. I'm going to start working on part two right away. I usually, when I have a series, I usually publish them all together. But I'm going to publish this one first. And there's a lot more to come. But on the 50th episode, what I want you to do is I want you to honestly believe that this breakup is the best thing that ever happened to you. You want to be with somebody who wants to be with you. You want to be with somebody who cherishes you, who thinks that, who wakes up every single day and says, I'm the luckiest person in the world because this person is with me. You want that 3 a.m. person. You want that person who the roof is leaking, the baby's crying, the dog wants to go out, the thunder and lightning storm is raging and the dog's afraid of it. And there's no electricity and the roof is leaking and all kinds of crap is going on. You want the person who says, you know what, hon? You do this, I'll do that. Let's pull together. Let's get this done. That's the person you want. Not Mr. Meth Head who has a gambling problem and living at home with mom and dad. That's not the person you want. And until you find the 3 a.m. person, please stop having kids with all these other crazy people. Okay, so I'm going to go into part two and how you avoid turning this into something that's not the best thing that ever happened to you. All right. Happy 50th episode. Thank you all so much for the reviews. Thank you so much for the support. Thank you so much for the email. Keep them coming. Keep everything coming. Please, please, please remember to rate and review. It's very, very important. And I'll see you all on part two. Talk to you guys later.